Should you run through the rain? If you run, perhaps the frequency of the raindrops hitting you will increase and you'll get wetter. Or perhaps it won't. Maybe you should walk. I'm going to tackle this with a little bit of physics and some Manum animations. But first of all, we need to constrain this question a little more and make some simplifying assumptions. We're going to look at this two ways. First of all, let's assume that you'll be traveling a constant distance. And this is the most likely scenario you will find yourself in. You start at point A, you have to walk or run to point B, and you can take as long or short of a time as you want to. Less commonly found probably in the real world kind of situation is constant time. So what if, for example, you are shut out of your house and you have to wait for a fixed amount of time for somebody to get the key and let you in? Should you just stand there in the rain or should you run around in circles looking like a, a bit of an idiot, which is better? So we're going to take a look at both of those. First of all, though, some simplifying assumptions. We will first assume terminal velocity of the raindrops. So we'll assume that they've been falling through the air for a long enough distance that they've reached a constant speed. So the upward force of air resistance is equal to the downward force due to gravity. And that means we won't have to consider acceleration in this problem, which is kind of nice. We'll also, by the way, assume that you, as the person in the rain, will always be traveling at a constant speed as well. We're also going to assume even spacing of the water drops. Obviously, rain drops are not evenly spaced, but it's going to make the math a lot easier. And we can basically justify this by saying that this even spacing is just the average spacing of water drops. So over a long enough time period, it doesn't really matter whether they're evenly spaced or not. We're just using the average. A couple more assumptions. We are going to assume everything is in 2D. There's no point in diving directly into three dimensions. We'll just do 2D. And then finally, um, I do apologize, but you, the person in the rain, are going to be treated as a simple board shape. So this will be you running through the rain with rain slanting in, hitting the board. The board will be a fixed length. We can vary that if we like, but I think the most interesting parameter will be at what angle this has to be tilted. So this is all about what surface area you're exposing to the rain. All right, those are the simplifying assumptions. Now let's get started with the physics. Here we have the basic setup. This is a Manum animation of water droplets falling down towards the ground. You can see their equal spacing, and you can see the board that is you running through the rain and intercepting the drops. I have a little counter on the top left that tells me how many drops I'm hitting, and the drops that are um, hitting the board do appear in red slightly before they, they disappear. So this is our basic setup. Um, addressing the physics in this case, where we have a moving board, is actually a little tricky. And so what we're going to do is move into the reference frame of you, the runner, so in this case, the board. And let's take a look at that. Here we are in the reference frame of the board, and you can see the board therefore is stationary, and the raindrops, instead of just falling vertically downwards, are, are now shifting to the left towards the board. This is what you would see as the runner if you were running through the rain. So we're going to use this reference frame, but there's one little thing more that we need to do, and I'm going to show that to you by... Um, revealing where these dots exactly are hitting the board. What I'm showing in this animation is a gray line that passes through every raindrop. That gray line is parallel to the drop's velocity vector, so it shows us what direction the drops are moving in. And you can see that a lot of gray lines are intersecting the board. It's quite messy. We could feasibly use geometry to figure out the spacing of those lines and also how many drop is coming along, how many drops are coming along each individual line. But there's a little trick that we can do to actually simplify this that won't change anything else important about the problem. What I've done is shift horizontally each row of raindrops so that they are now lined up and there are fewer 
of these paths that the raindrops are traveling toward the board. So you can see it's a lot less cluttered. And all I've done is, as I say, shift the locations of the raindrops. I haven't changed their spacing, either vertically or horizontally. So the overall volume and frequency of the raindrops remains the same. So this is the, the final picture that we are now going to freeze and analyze for the actual volume of water hitting the board, and therefore whether you should walk or run through the rain. One of the first steps we can take in our analysis is a conservation of mass observation. The cloud that's producing the rain is going to produce raindrops at the same frequency regardless of what speed we happen to be traveling through underneath that cloud. What that means in our animations is that along those gray lines that the drops are taking, we should measure at the board the same frequency of hits of raindrops on the board along a given line. And this may seem kind of surprising, um, and I'll, I'll try and explain a little bit in terms of geometry in just a second, but just to prove it to you, here are a couple of videos. One has a moving board, one has a stationary board, and this time we're just counting the number of raindrops that hit the board uh, along one of those gray lines, one of those paths. And you can tell that in the 15 second interval that I ran these animations, you get pretty much, give or take, the same number of raindrops. So the frequency is the same regardless of the speed of the board. Here are two snapshots of those animations. To the left is the, the example with the stationary board. And take a look at the distance a drop has to travel before the next drop hits. That is shorter than the distance a drop has to travel in the moving case. So the distance is shorter, but the velocity in this case is gr on the right-hand side is greater. So if we look at the left, let's assume the drops are all falling at a velocity u. On the right-hand side, they're still falling at a velocity u, but now we've added the horizontal relative velocity of the board as well, call that v. And so this hypotenuse here is longer, so it's a greater velocity than on the left-hand side. So on the left we have short distance but a small velocity, and here we have a greater distance but also a greater velocity. And so that ends up meaning that those drops take the same amount of time to hit the board, and therefore the frequency is the same. Let's define some parameters in this field of raindrops. The horizontal spacing we will call delta, and the vertical spacing we will call lambda. Now velocities we need to define as well. Let's call the downward velocity of the raindrops u, and then since the board is moving to the right in the re reference frame of the board, the raindrops are going to be moving to the left, and so we'll give them a leftward velocity of v. As just discussed a little earlier, each of these lines is delivering rain at a frequency f, so that's the number of drops hitting the board every second. So that means in one second, the volume of rain received by the board along one of those lines is V0F, where V0 is the volume of a single drop of rain. That's just one line, the line I've, I've, I've drawn in yellow. But of course there are contributions from all of these lines over here, and these come from an area of the sky that completes this triangle, and it has a, a total horizontal distance x. The way we figure out the number of lines is if we were to know x, we would divide by the horizontal spacing to get the number of lines. So that means I can update my equation here. v is v naught f times x over delta, because x over delta is the number of lines, and then each line delivers raindrops with a frequency f, and each raindrop has a volume v naught. So now we have a good start. The trick now is, what is this x? We're going to have to use the geometry of this scenario to find x in terms of angles, especially this angle which we'll define as theta, which is the angle of the board relative to the ground. I've redrawn the big triangle on this diagram and removed some of the clutter. I still have my angle theta and the number x along the top. And one thing I've added is I've defined the length of the board to be L, uppercase L. And what we're going to do now is try to find x, and we're going to use the sine rule to do this. For that, we need a couple of extra angles. Because this top line is parallel to the ground, this angle here is also theta, because of alternate angles. 
and we're going to call this angle alpha. That is determined completely by the ratio of the downward velocity and the horizontal velocity. As you can see, this line right here is parallel to these lines that the drops are taking. So if you look at, back at this velocity diagram, alpha is actually this angle here inside the velocity triangle, and that's going to become very useful because it means we can re-express alpha in terms of the velocities. Using the sine rule, we can write that the sine of alpha over L, so I'm using this angle and the opposite side, is the sine of this angle right here, and I'll get to that in just a second, divided by x, and it's that x that we want to solve for. Now, this angle down here on the bottom, we can work out just using the fact that all angles in a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees, or pi radians. I prefer to work in radians, so therefore this angle is pi minus theta minus alpha. All right. If one rearranges that um, and uses things like addition rules for tri trigonometry, then we end up with something that looks like this. So I'm not going to go through all of those details right here, but this is the end result. That's our value of x. Tangent of alpha, as you can see from this top triangle, is just the ratio of u over v. And that means 1 over tangent alpha is v over u. So now I can write this as x equals l times v over u sine theta plus cosine theta. What I'm going to do next is substitute that back into our original expression for the volume of rain hitting the board. Here is our result from earlier on, and I'm going to substitute this expression for x into that original volume result. So v is v naught f over delta, and then instead of x we have l v over u sine theta plus cosine theta. What I'd like to do next is remove the appearance of frequency in this equation because, as you recall at the beginning of the video, we wanted to look at two cases, one that had a constant distance we need to travel through the rain, and one a constant time. And right now I don't have either distance or time in this equation, and we can get around that by using frequency. And do recall that we, we established a little earlier that the frequency is the same along each path that the raindrops are taking, no matter what speed we're traveling at. So we can pick the simplest case of we're not traveling at all, and it appears to us as if the raindrops are just falling down vertically, since that's what they're doing. And we're going to treat this as a wave phenomenon. It's a repeating event that occurs in time and space. And the wavelength of this is simply the distance between raindrops. And that's indeed why I chose lambda as the vertical spacing. Um, the frequency we can uh, connect to the wavelength using an equation frequently used with waves, and that is that the speed of the wave is the product of the frequency and the wavelength. If we solve here for f, we get f equals u over lambda. So what I'm going to do now is just plug that into our result. v is equal to v naught. So instead of f, I have u over lambda, I still have my delta, so now I have both spacing variables in the denominator. I have L still remaining as well, and then everything in the parentheses. The last um, step here, just to neaten things up a little bit, is to multiply this U through by all terms, and so it'll disappear from the top, it'll disappear from this term over here, and it will appear in the right-hand term. And that is our result for one second's worth of being exposed to the rain. If we wanted a, a longer period of time, we just multiply by that period of time, say, t. And so this is actually the answer to our second scenario in which you are out in the rain for a specific period of time, t. If the size of the raindrops increases, you will get wetter. 
If your size increases, you will get wetter. If you stay out in the rain longer, you will get wetter. If you decrease either the horizontal or the vertical spacing between raindrops, there will be more water around. Once again, you'll get wetter. So all of the stuff out front seems to make sense. What about your velocity v, your horizontal velocity? If you de This says that if you decrease your horizontal velocity, you won't get as wet. So in the scenario where you're stuck outside your house for a fixed amount of time, it's best just to stand still. You'll get less wet that way. Also, if you are moving, then we can see that since sine theta increases with the angle theta, we want to take ourselves, if we are just really a flat shape, and reduce our forward profile as much as possible, make ourselves nice and flat and streamlined so that we are not getting wet due to our horizontal motion through the rain field. On the other hand, since the rain is always moving down with the velocity u, there's this term here that reaches zero when the board is vertical. In other words, it's exposing less surface area to, to the um, sky. So at a first glance anyway, this all kind of makes sense. Let's look at what happens when our distance is fixed. So this is our original scenario where you have to get from point A to point B. If we're traveling a constant distance, let's call that D, then that will be equal to our horizontal velocity multiplied by the time we take to do that. So it's just the equation for uniform motion. That means that T is D over V. So what I'm going to do is substitute this expression for T up here where we see time in our volume formula. So V is V naught L D over delta times lambda times V. And then the parentheses are the same. Finally, just multiply through by this factor of one over V into the parentheses. So we're back to just two distances here at the bottom. V's cancel in this first term. And in the second term, we have a ratio of u over v. And the new thing that this is telling us is that for a fixed distance d, if we increase our horizontal velocity, then this whole term goes down. So we'll get drier if we move faster, if we want to get from one fixed point to another fixed point. So yes, run through the rain if you want to get from one location to another. So that kind of makes sense. Let's wrap up by considering a couple of extreme cases. And by extreme, I mean the relationship between the horizontal velocity of, the, of you or the board moving across and the vertical velocity of the rain. Let's first look at what happens if the velocity of the rain is very much greater than the velocity of you going through the rain. So this might apply to, for example, a snail crawling very, very slowly through the rain. You can see that the second term is going to be very large because u over v is going to be very big. So we can, for the moment, kind of ignore this first term, which just has sine theta and no velocities. So in that case, we have v equals v naught l d delta lambda u over v cosine theta. The inter interesting thing to note here is the combination of l times cosine theta is how much length you would you would see if you were looking down on the board. So it's basically how much of that board is exposed to the rain. And that's really important in this case because we're hardly moving horizontally. So the main impact is, is from vertically above. The opposite extreme is if the rain is falling extremely slowly <clears throat> compared to your horizontal velocity. So in this case, u is very much less than v which means now the second term is going to be very, very small, vanishingly small. So only the first term remains. So in the limit, at least, we get V naught L D over delta lambda and then sine theta. This time, the combination of L times sine theta is the length that you would see if you were standing next to the board looking at it. And so it's the amount of, of length that's exposed to the front direction. And that kind of makes sense because now it's the, the forward velocity is the only one that really counts. The other interesting thing is that you'll notice there aren't actually any velocities in this equation anymore. What we basically have here in this extreme is a field of stationary raindrops. They aren't moving at all. And we have to get from point A to point B. So it doesn't matter what speed we travel, we are going to hit the same number of raindrops because they are just suspended in air 
it's a fixed amount, um, which is kind of an interesting result. That's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.